Good to have you with us, Ed Schultz, Susan, commentary on this Monday edition. Well, it's been an eventful day here in Washington, D.C. If you're a Democrat, a liberal, you would be saying, well, the rats are leaving the ship. If you're a Republican, a hard righty, you're saying, well, this is what drain in the swamp looks like. Two senators in the Republican caucus making big news today. The ongoing battle between Bob Corker, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Donald Trump has reached a level of almost hatred for one another. And the backdrop of this is a moderate Republican from Arizona, Jeff Flake, who has also been a Trump critic, has decided that he will not run for re-election, although that re-election won't be for 14 months. So uh, Flake said that it's just not enough to be conservative. It's a toxic atmosphere. He won't be complicit to the actions and behavior of this president. And so this was a pretty dramatic announcement on the Senate floor and the depth and range in which he used and went pretty much underscores the nature of the political climate in this town. Uh, quoting Teddy Roosevelt, talking about dignity and loyalty Flake based his decision on the absence of qualities brought on by this president. I need reaction from my good friend and longtime journalist and author, John Nichols, Washington correspondent of The Nation magazine. John, good to have you with us today. Ed, you could have picked a more interesting day. Interesting, one for the archives, one that's going to be studied yeah. for a long time. Now, I want to point out that the White House just held a briefing, and Sarah Huckabee Sanders says that... Uh, both Corker and Flake have got poor polling numbers, and this is probably good for the Republicans. In the meantime, the president's having lunch on Capitol Hill today, trying to gin up enough support to pass his tax package and also talk about rolling out his war on uh, opioids next week. And over on the House side, your native congressman, Paul Ryan, is saying, hey, everybody just stick together here. Let's focus on trying to get something mm -hmm. done. Unpack this for us. What do you make of it? Well, I, I'm not sure anybody listened to Paul Ryan today. <laughs> he came out, he did his big thing of, you know, don't listen to tweets and don't listen to all this back and forth. And then within moments, the guy that Ryan served with in the House before Flake went to the Senate uh, steps up and announces he's not going for a new term. And, uh, look, this is a very big deal. But it is a big deal for the country more than it is for the Republican Party. And let me explain that. Uh, the White House is right that, that Flake's poll numbers weren't so great, and Corker's poll numbers weren't so great, in a Republican primary. The important thing to understand, of course, is that, that Flake's poll numbers will uh, undoubtedly have been better than whoever is nominated by the Republican Party. And that's because, to replace him, because he was popular uh, beyond the narrow confines of an extreme right-wing pro-Trump Republican Party, he made it he sound like there's no he made it sound like there's no room for him in the Republican Party anymore. He went so far as to say that the Republican Party has lost its core values, and that yeah. and there's no lost room there's no room for him anymore. Uh, has Arizona politics gotten that hard right, or is it the country? Um, I, I think it's. It's a little both. Uh, no, I don't think Arizona politics is that hard right. In fact, there's a, a decent <laughs> chance that Blake will be replaced by a Democrat, a relatively liberal Democrat, uh, Kristen Sinema. But um, the, the nature of the Republican Party is fundamentally different than what it was. And I think people struggle with this. I, I honestly think that there are a lot of people who cannot acknowledge this reality. Donald Trump won. He won the Republican Party. Yeah, uh, you can you know try and spin it some other way or talk about it some other way, but you know last fall everybody thought Trump was going to be wiped out on November eighth because Republican women or some other portion of the Republican Party would abandon him. They didn't abandon him. No. He's got the Republican Party, but and I, I'm as not, a I'm, result. I'm not yeah, quite sure. I'm not quite sure the American people, even Republicans, thought that this president would be so visceral to his own party. And uh, Flake, yeah. saying that, Flake saying that he would not be complicit to this behavior. Uh, Bob Corker saying that he's untruthful. Bob Corker questioning his character right to the core. Um, 
is this going to mount in the Republican Party to the point where maybe the Republicans won't get the tax package that they've been promising? What, the, what about the politics of this? No, politics are big. I mean, this is a very, very big deal. because it, and, and that's sort of the core of this thing. This isn't going to change the Republican Party. The Republican Party's on a trajectory. It's loyal to Trump. Ryan and McConnell will remain loyal to Trump. Uh, and so you're not going to see some big pivot on the part of the Republican Party. But for those who have, uh, you know, broken with this consensus or broken with this internal uh, direction by saying they're not going to run for re-election, so they've got no strings attached to them, people like Corker and Blake and potentially others, uh, they are suddenly freed, as are the people who have been dissidents up to this point, folks like Susan Collins and, and to some extent John McCain, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, that's five senators now, yeah. maybe more, who are freed to go against uh, Donald Trump and against the party leadership. On the tax issue, some of these are very conservative Republicans, and so they may actually still work with Trump on some elements of it. But their, their influence becomes much greater, because any time one of these folks says, oh, I might have to align with the Democrats, it becomes much more powerful. But here, Ed, is, I'm going to suggest something, a bigger deal. And, and you say, well, what could be a bigger deal than taxes? Well, war and peace. And this is the interesting thing. Yeah. Flake has said in interviews just in the last few minutes that one of the things he'll be focusing on in his last year in Congress or in the Senate is taking away the authorization to the use of military force that was issued in 2001, right after the 9-11 attack, and that the Trump administration continues to use as its authorization for military endeavors abroad. He and wants to work with other senators to get rid of that and to force Trump to come to Congress and ask for permission to do things internationally. Yeah, uh, That's very, very significant, because Rand Paul agrees with him on that, as do a couple of other senators. And so you're starting to look at a situation where, on the issue of war and peace, you may now have a Senate majority that is willing to say no to Donald Trump. Well, you know, what's interesting about this. We are in 70 countries fighting al-Qaeda and also ISIS. And, of course, Niger is a big play right now because we lost four soldiers mm -hmm. and all the facts have not come out. And that, of course, would play under the umbrella of what you're talking about, the use of military force in, in injecting, inter in, in injecting international intervention. And, and I think everybody's pretty concerned about what could evolve out of uh, the back and forth with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Next week's uh, Asian trip here uh, by the president for 12 days is going to be paramount. Uh, and so Sinju Abe, who is the prime minister of Japan, won a big snap election. He's going to be very emboldened to uh, take on North Korea. So that is a, a trusted and needed ally for Trump or any American president. This, uh, the, in, in, getting back to the Corker, Corker is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This isn't just some ordinary there you, go. you know, that some ordinary yeah. guy that just got in there. I mean, he, he knows a lot and he and he has a lot of friends in the senate has a lot of respect and for trump to say in in a tweet that he couldn't get elected dog catcher this president i i, I think uh he's hard to love he's easy <laughs> he's he's easy to hate if you're a political opponent and he has crossed the line of human decency and dignity in many respects and i think that that was the that was really the core message that Jeff Flake gave to the country today, is that this guy is beyond the pale when it comes to dignity and human decency, and he's hurting the country. And so... That's exactly, yeah. Uh, your thoughts That's on right, all yeah. that? Well, you, you just summed it up, and you summed it up very well by, by looking at you know both these global and domestic issues. Uh, I think that there is a human decency element of it. Uh, I can give you a, a sense of it, just how different Jeff Flake is from uh, Donald Trump. Jeff Flake's family goes back generations in Arizona. It's one of the first families, or, or one of the early uh, settler families in, in Arizona a very long time ago. And um, he's a very moral guy, whether you like him or not, whether you agree with him or not, on particular issues. One time somebody quoted him as saying, damn, and he contacted the reporter to correct him and say, I never used the word damn. I mean, that's the kind of guy he is. He is a very, very proper gentleman. 
whether you, again, whether you agree with him on issues or not. And so I think he's one of these people who always had a problem with Trump, stylistically. But if you read the text of his speech, he repeatedly refers to Donald Trump as dangerous. Yeah. And so it is a combination of a stylistic break and also the Corker concern, that concern that this guy really is threatening to the, the character of the country and potentially even in a broader sense. And that's why I circle back again and again to these foreign policy issues. I think you are starting to see with Corker, with Flake, with several of these other centers, and you can never underestimate the role of Rand Paul in all this, a, a, a group of Republicans who are preparing and, and ready to say no to Donald Trump yeah. on issues like the Iran Treaty and other, you know, or other major issues. Yeah. John Nichols, it's always great to visit. Thank you for your time. We'll do it again, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. It's a pleasure to talk to you. You bet. Washington correspondent of The Nation magazine, John Nichols. Hey, Ed, okay, so uh, you and John are talking about this Jeff Flake scenario, and Jeff Flake gave a humongous, impassioned speech today on the Senate floor, uh, mainly about how he couldn't go on in this divisive uh, way that politics is working in America. But isn't it his, uh, his responsibility as a high-ranking senator to say, well, then I'm going to use my position to further discourse. I'm not going to, you know, pack up and go home. I'm going to work even harder to try and, and change the political climate in this country. Well, I have some friends that have left the Senate uh, years ago. Uh, Byron Dorgan, Kent Conrad um, from North Dakota, who just felt like they couldn't get anything done that there was a, a, a visceral attitude from the Tea Party that they didn't think was productive. And if you look at uh, when they got out back in 2010, 2012, there's not a whole hell of a lot that's been done since then. So I think they called it right. And I think that Jeff Flake uh, is pretty, pretty much in that arena, is that sick of the divide, sick of the the nature of the job, they, they travel on Monday, they travel on Friday, they have to raise upwards of $15,000 a day uh, to keep pace on, a, on any normal Senate race. Uh, Citizens United, uh, the, the discourse is outrageous. I, I said a few years ago that the Republican Party is in the midst of an identity crisis. I think that came on full display today when Jeff Flake said there's no room for me in the Republican Party it's not enough to be conservative you got to be more than that you got to be mad you got to you got to hate and I I just uh, and he says he won't be complicit to the behavior of this president he may be centering the moral compass again of the Republican Party as opposed to the radicals this is no doubt a win for Steve Bannon and the nut jobs on the right wing. Uh, this is draining the swamp uh, in their world. But I don't even think Trump knows what he's doing politically. I think that he's just a jerk to a lot of people and people in Washington aren't used to it. And I also believe that his attack early today on Bob Corker, the way he did it in the tweet fest was to change the conversation in news cycle off of a grieving military wife on the heels of the Pentagon not having answers for the attack in Niger from ISIS that killed four Americans and Trump doubling down and trying to get the last word against this grieving widow. I mean, there's who wins in this deal? And so what's he do? He changes the subject, comes out and picks his corker target, says we're going to talk taxes. He goes to lunch on Capitol Hill, lays out his agenda. No big shakes there. Uh, Mitch McConnell comes out and says what they talked about. There's really no big story. And that's it. I mean, I think he was trying to really, and then in the midst of all of this, Flake doubles down himself personally and says, you know what, I don't, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. Why Flake did it? I think he's just tired of it, the way a lot of people get tired of it. It's kind of a lousy job, but also he gave a, a, a real reason as to why he was doing it. It, it. It's the climate that's not productive that he doesn't want to be a part of. And for him to say that he won't be complicit in this president's behavior, that's a shot at Trump in a big manner, in a big way. Absolutely. And, and Ed, I guess something that came to me, and I don't know that there necessarily is a correlation here, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. 
you know, uh, during the Obama years, you and along with some, you know, Democratic senators, Democratic congressional members, were critical of the policy of President Obama, whether it was... Um, you know, use of military, like you talked about the authorization of use of military force, trade agreements, um, you know, Bush extending the Bush-era tax cuts, uh, you know, possibility of taking out Social Security. And there was a lot of discussion. You know, people, Democratic senators were not afraid to tell Obama, hey, I disagree with you on this, and this is why, and come out publicly and say, you're wrong. And, well, the, that's because they knew that the president wasn't going to hold it against them. Right. You oppose this president... And he'll take your head off and then he'll go campaign against you. And then he'll gin up his wild base that is politically active 24 seven. And it makes you feel like nobody in the room likes you anymore. He'll, he'll wear you down. And I, I don't know is it, if this is the American politics that do we get anything done doing this? Uh, they haven't got infrastructure. They haven't got any trade deals. They haven't got health care. And they claim they're going to get a tax package done by the end of the year. I mean, they could go into 2018, the next session of Congress, having done nothing under Trump other than his executive orders in reducing regulations and gutting the Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, I mean, th this is not the governance that the country was looking for. So it is what it is. And it, there's... <laughs> it's pretty damn goofy is what it is. <laughs> I guess one more question about your last point there. Did you ever think there was a world where a Republican president, Republican Senate, and Republican Congress couldn't pass tax cuts? No. <laughs> and when Bush had the power, he was able to get two rounds of tax cuts. And uh, he was able to get reelected in 2004. So that Republican Party, the backdrop of the Iraq war getting reelected, as unpopular as it was, and the two rounds of tax cuts... Uh, and Glass-Steagall, which was under Clinton, but it was really pushed hard by the Republicans. I mean, this Republican Party can't do any of that now. Nothing. And so they have the power, and for the first time, they don't know what to do with it. John Nichols made an interesting point. Rand Paul now becomes a pretty key figure in all of this. And the, the other thing is, as far as this tax package is concerned, the deficit will go to $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years, and that's the minor estimate. That is the detailed estimate. That, that's just the sketchy estimate. I thought the Republicans were always concerned about the budget and record deficits and record debt and worried about the federal government being solvent at some level. 